life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding. Savior and King, when He sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. This treasure I have in a temple of clay. singing and good start. Lord, I ask you please bless the rest of it. I ask you bless the special music and uh, all of the uh, thinking and all the preparing, all the studying that went into this lesson tonight. And uh, Lord, we're so thankful uh, for Brother Angus Ath taking 30 plus years of his life uh, that he said he used for himself and giving it to you and you taking that and using it to be an edification to the body of Christ today all over the country, all over the West, Lord. I know it's been an encouragement to other pastors I've talked to in other churches, and it's been a blessing the last two nights. Lord, I ask that you would please bless this evening. I ask that you give them the words to say that we need to hear. I ask that you give us the ears to hear and the heart to receive uh, what he has prepared for us, what he's laid on his heart tonight. I ask that, uh, <clears throat> ask that you get involved in it and that you would speak to hearts here today. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How about 227? 227, The Cleansing Wave. 227 in the blue book again. Oh, now I see the cleansing wave, the fountain deep and wide. Jesus, my Lord, my teacher, save points to his wounded side. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and do. Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. 
more song. I didn't pick one more. Does anybody have a request? Great is thy faithfulness, is that number uh, 40? Great is thy faithfulness, number 40. on it and uh, so he's already here so I don't need to say anything. Let's have uh, the girls come up for a special that are singing and Brother Angus uh, just come on right up after they're done.
Find these two places in your Bible. We'll go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12 first. It'll be a little while before we get there. Um, you know, I know there's a climate of fear, I'm going to call it, that is pretty much gripping this country, gripping the world. It's really a climate of uncertainty. And uh, I think as believers, we should take advantage of that climate of uncertainty. And it's a great opportunity uh, to invite people to church to spread the gospel and, and all those things you know we should be doing. So you know the, the theme of this meeting, probably couldn't tell it from the two messages preached, but the real theme of this meeting is preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. And the sub-theme is about us serving, because that's how you get prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. And tomorrow we'll get really specific about that. But I want to talk to you a little bit about this, this climate of fear. And speaking of part of the fear is not just from this virus that's going around the world, but how about, you know, the thing that's resurfaced again and really strongly is climate change. All right? And I forgot to bring this book with me, but I could have quoted, I'll just paraphrase it instead, a couple articles written, this is nothing new, this uh, climate change, nothing new. Back in the late 70s, I've got this book that cites a couple articles. One of them is for the New York Times, and one of them is uh, from a Newsweek magazine, and they're both, and that one's, uh, I think they're uh, quoting the National Academy of Sciences or something. But they both pretty much say the same thing, and this is to paraphrase what they say. They're talking about how this, this thing with climate change has actually reached epic proportions and it's gotten to the point where nobody's doing enough about it anyway to make any difference. It's actually past the point of no return. That's what they said 40 years ago. And the real kicker is that they weren't talking about global warming. They were talking about global cooling. Yeah. So come on. You have a Bible, a King James Bible, that warns about uh, paying too much attention to uh, science falsely so-called. I actually think I use the word of opposition of science falsely so-called. And that's what we're getting right now. Uh, we're getting opposition to our normal freedoms and liberties and ways of life. And for a believer, the, the, the trap is this. Your focus gets on that stuff, which, hey, you and I can't control a whole lot about what's going on with that. But the thing we can control on is maybe spending some time trying to do something that has eternal consequences. I think if anything else, a, a believer should realize this world is on the verge of unraveling. And that's a good thing, because the Lord's coming back. It just makes it more imminent, in my, my opinion. So beware of the opposition of science, falsely so-called. All right, I'm going to uh, start making something up here, and uh, we'll pray in a minute. But I want you to be in 1 Corinthians 12 and have one thumb there in Proverbs 6. And I want to tell you a little story that's got to do with what I've got written up here. There's this young man, and he uh, gets saved in late, late teens. Right away, the Lord uh, presses upon his heart that he needs to go to Bible school, and he does that. And he's only there a short period of time, maybe just a few days. And all of a sudden he realizes kind of unexpectedly that he doesn't feel this uh, sense of excitement and satisfaction. And, and really contentment is probably the better word. He does not feel content with his current circumstances. And one by one he starts approaching uh, some of his professors just kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I think he counsels with four or five of them. And then he takes all that information that they individually give him, and he can't even put his finger on it. He just says, you know, I just have this unsettled feeling. I don't know where it's coming from, but something's wrong. So with as little information as he could give them, and he takes all the information, the counsel that they gave him, and he boils it down to two words. He knew from their counsel that he needed to let God. Now that in itself may be somewhat ambiguous, but that was the message. Let God, just let God. That's what you need to do. You just need to settle down and let God. Okay? Uh, good advice for all of us. 
Listen, um, he took those six letters, cut them out of some kind of red cardstock he had. He, he actually pinned them, tacked them on the apartment wall, and he kind of was repeating that phrase over and over for days. Matter of fact, he got to one point, I think it was on a Saturday afternoon, uh, he, he'd just been focusing on those words, still not feeling that sense of peace and, and comfort and contentment that he was searching for. And he got in such a huff that he really just, he, he had to get out of the apartment, he had to get away from those two words to let God. So he, he runs out and he, he's out for a long walk just so he can kind of cool down. And uh, as he's out walking, uh, spends hours out there just walking around trying not to think of those two words, let God. He finally gets back to his apartment and he realizes because it's gotten dark now, he opens the door, it's dark in his apartment, he has to flip on the light switch and he looks across uh, the, the, the living room at that wall where those uh, words are tacked up. And I guess it must be when he slammed the door to leave it created a backdrop one of those letters actually fell down and he had a new message and that new message was let go and then you can let God Amen. so that's what I want to preach on tonight let's pray Heavenly Father uh, thank you for the day you've given us again beautiful beautiful day out there Lord we appreciate this fine weather at this time of year and Lord I thank you for the souls you brought out tonight Lord we have a, a room full of believers here and I pray you'd speak to their hearts and minister to them Lord Help us to realize that if we are going to let God rule and reign in our lives, then there's maybe some things that we individually need to let go of. So help us, uh, Lord, to appreciate the principles that we get from your word through this message, Lord, and then help us to not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And we ask it all for the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. I want to talk to you uh, about vessels. Uh, you know, a lot of times these messages I'm bringing you uh, prior to Sunday are messages I do afterwards. So some of you don't have a basic understanding so much, which we'll get into tomorrow, about the potter and the clay and how God made us out of clay and we're clay vessels. I think you know that. I appreciate what Pastor said. You know, you're just singing a song there a few minutes ago, and it's like, oh, there's a vessel mentioned in that. It has a whole new meaning, doesn't it? because now you know a little bit more about what that's talking about. I, I, if you were here Wednesday night, we talked about one of the aspects of God's words are their cleansing power. And then we just read this, this hymn, 226, The Cleansing Wave, and that chorus mentions the word cleansing once and cleanseth four times. So you just sang the word cleansing slash cleanseth 15 times. I hope you appreciate that what they're talking about the cleansing aspects of these words it's a major part as you'll find out tomorrow of the sanctification process because they don't cleanse you when they're just sitting on your coffee table That's right. I don't care how many King James Bibles you have if you're not spending time in them they're not performing their cleansing that they're capable of doing if you'll spend time in them so You and I are vessels of clay, and we can use adjectives to describe different vessels, and we could use those same adjectives to describe people. So I'm going to have four or five vessels up here. Here's a vessel. What could you say about this vessel that you could say about a person? I'll help you out. It's plain, simple, you know, not ordinary. Nothing wrong with that. That could describe you. It could describe someone you know. Uh, this one happens to have scripture on it. It says rejoice evermore. So it could remind you of someone that maybe you know that you'll see from time to time with a scripture verse on their t-shirt or what have you. I got one on right myself right now. How about that? Here's a vessel. Very unusual. I'd throw this at you and have you catch it, but it'd probably bury you. This thing weighs about 20 pounds. It's, it's why we get such terrible mileage in our motorhome. <laughs> My wife made this many years ago, and it's a, it's, it's a fruit basket, bread basket combo that can go in your oven, and it's so much clay in this thing that it absorbs that heat and then maintains it. 
So if you want to have uh, you know, fresh bread inside of that, inside of a towel or whatever, keeps that heat in there. So what, without all that explanation, what could you say about this vessel that you might be able to say about some person? Anybody have anything they want to say about that? It's what? Sturdy, yeah, it's sturdy, all right. Man, I can hardly hold this thing up with two hands. Anything different? Unique. Different. Different, okay. Uh, holy. Are we supposed to be holy? Um, the thing I get from it, I know a lot of you get it, but you're afraid to admit it, twisted. So I think, you know, if you're honest, there's something in your personality that's probably a little twisted, or somebody you know. Of course, it's your brother, sister, or your mother, or father, or something like that, I'm sure, right? Twisted. How about this vessel? I don't know if you had a chance to look at this. This is a very simple shape, and because it's a simple shape, it's appropriate to put a very intricate, repeating design on it. You don't put this kind of design on something very shapely, because those two things compete with each other. So this is very reminiscent of what the American, the Native American Indians do, especially those that are, have tribes that are devoted or, uh, to making pottery. And when we were in the Southwest, this is now like 11 years ago, uh, we went through New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and you see a lot of those tribes and you see their pottery. And so kind of inspired by their work, I, I started doing some of this work. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that every human being that's alive on planet Earth today is a descendant of one of three tribes that came off of, three races that came off of Noah's Ark. And that's Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the races are different, okay? Uh, they are. And God made one of those races more spiritual. And that's the tribe of Shem. That's all the authors of our King James Bible. That's a messianic line. They're just more spiritual. That's the way it is. The American Indians are descendants of that race of people. And I want to tell you something. I think their spirituality shows up because they'll take the time to do this exacting, repeating decoration, time consuming, do it on places that you might never see, like the bottom of the vessel. Not only that, pieces that are uh, this big, this big, if they can get inside of a vessel this big, you would see that exact same care taken to decorate the inside of the vessel. It's amazing. What's neat about it is that why do I think that's a picture of their spirituality? Because he's a whole lot more concerned. God's more concerned with what's inside of you than what's outside of you. It's the inward, not the outward appearance that's important to God. So, what could you say about this vessel? Oh, let's what, I didn't give you a chance. What would you say about this vessel? Anything? Quiet, silence. I'm going to help you out for the sake of time. Uh, I think of this, to me, the quality I see in this is a perfectionist. You know, now, this is by no means perfect. Their stuff is perfect. You'd, you'd swear a machine did it. I mean, it is so exact. Now, this is carved. They usually just paint their stuff on there. But I'm telling you, it, the precision is amazing. So precise, perfectionist, detail-oriented, you know, these are characteristics of this vessel they could say about some people we know. We're vessels of clay, so it stands to reason we can use the same adjectives for different vessels. How about this one? Anybody got a, an adjective that could describe this, that might describe a person? Silence. Okay, that's all right. Um, Uh, I think it's kind of the shape, you know, I, this one, um, I think of more humility. This one I think more of pride, maybe because it's puffed out a little bit. Kind of a fancy decoration. I don't know. You know, the one I really want to get your opinion on if you got one is what about this vessel right up here? Anybody have anything to say that would describe this vessel? I heard it unfinished. unfinished. Yeah. Anything else? Huh? Still being formed. Still being formed. Work, work in progress. Yeah. Well, let me finish it as much as I can. But I'll get the shape I'm after here. And I expect one of you second row people to chime up on this one. 
because I'm sure you've got an adjective to describe this. Okay. Yeah, almost done. Say, say that again? Okay. So this is a first care of brother, I don't know his name, that, but that's it. Uh, what would you say, what could you say about this vessel? Go ahead, just shout it out. That's it. They, they get it every time. Messed up. Right? Yeah, that's, you know, if you're under 20, that's what you're going to say. So, um, I think you're under 20. I'm not sure. But listen, um, anybody else say anything about this vessel? Huh? Crazy? Yeah, why not? It's kind of a crazy look. You know, crazy can be kind of an adjective that's not necessarily derogatory. You know that your uh, God is a great and terrible God, and that terrible is a compliment because of his terrifying, awesome power. Ready for the recycling. Ready for the recycling. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> you know, crazy cool right there. I like it. Uh, well, let's read in 1 Corinthians what God thinks about that. First Corinthians 12, make sure you got your hand there in Proverbs 6. I'm not going to be as fast as you. Let's see, First Corinthians chapter 12. Let's pick it up in verse 14. First Corinthians 12, 14 says, The body is not one member, but many. For the body is not one member, but many. Skip down to verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Interesting. I feel like I have clay in my nose. Is that a possibility? I just feel something there. Okay. My wife says, you know, I should just take some of that mud and just smear it across my face, and then I don't have to worry about it. You'll get over it after a while. Uh, skip down to verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You know, that would be the way I might describe that, feeble. Uh, before I went to Bible school, before I uh, really got into baking pottery, I had a job for a few years as kind of a social worker. And I worked with... Um, mildly retarded young men. And so that kind of reminds me of them. Some of them were kind of strange looking, a little different. They talked strange. These were mildly retarded young men. When I was in Bible school, I worked with severely physically and mentally retarded people, and they were very different, almost scary. So. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of knee, and again the head of the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Verse 24, For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. I think what those verses are indicating is that this looks like an unworthy, a feeble type vessel, one that we might dismiss, but it's just the opposite in God's eyes. That's the type of vessel God can use if that vessel yields itself to his purposes. So, Although I'd say this vessel, you know, is a picture of humility, I would say even that more so. I'll tell you what's not in that vessel. There's no pride whatsoever in that vessel. And if these two vessels could talk to each other, I dare say if this vessel represents someone that's proud, this vessel would never be asking that vessel for any advice. But if he was smart enough, he might, and that vessel would say, I'll give you two words of advice, and those two words are, you 
need to let go. You need to let go and let God rule and reign in your life. Now, this message is going to be about broken things. And that's why I want you in Proverbs chapter 6, because God uses broken things. Look here in Proverbs chapter 6. I worked about two hours just for that two seconds of pleasure to break that down. So I also like to examine it to see how good a job I did in the making of it. I'll, I'll look at that later. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 6. Spiritually, this is very appropriate for you and I. Uh, doctrinally, this would not apply to you and I. And that's because it's talking about, well, you'll read it with me. Verse 12. Proverbs 6, 12, a naughty person, a wicked uh, man, walketh with a forward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. By the way, the reason I think we can spiritually apply this to ourselves is that we all have a wicked heart. Verse 12, okay? Uh, verse 14, forwardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly... Suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. Now that's the difference between us being able to apply this doctrinally versus spiritually. Because doctrinally, I'm telling you, there's things in your life, things in my life, that God wants to break us of, but we have a remedy. Our remedy is the Lord Jesus Christ and his purposes. So I want to give you some examples as I start to shape something else here. How God uses broken things. This may make a lot of noise when I crank her up here. I don't know. Let's see what's going on. Think about uh, Gideon's army. You know, we already mentioned it once. Gideon had uh, 32,000 men in his army. The Lord tells him to go down there and destroy 135,000 Midianites. They're encamped in a valley. And... Uh, he says, the only problem, Gideon, is you've got too many men in your army. So he puts them through a couple tests, gets that number down to uh, a total of 300 eventually. And then in the darkest hour of the night, Gideon gives each of his 300 soldiers an earthen pitcher. Inside of that earthen pitcher is a burning lamp. And on Gideon's command, they've got a trumpet in the other hand, by the way. On Gideon's command, they're supposed to break the earthen pitcher exposing the light that's inside of it. Then shout, Sword of the Lord, and of Gideon, and then just stand there and blow on that trumpet. Now, it sounds pretty crazy. Sounds really strange. But the Bible says that those Midianites, dazed, startled, confused, they wake up, they see the, the fire all around them, they hear the crashing of the breaking pitchers, they see the fire burning, and that shouting, and they just grab their knives and swords and spears and start stabbing whatever they can reach in the dark. They're killing each other. It says that 120,000 of them did kill each other. And the other 15,000 are tracked down by Gideon's 300, and they're destroyed as well. Well, the whole point is, uh, I think one of the reasons God used that particular battle strategy is to show you and I that sometimes if our light, that Holy Spirit inside of us, is going to shine, <laughs> that vessel needs to be broken. We'll have to let that light go out. I'll give you a heads up. You know, we're going to cover it tomorrow. There's, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And that treasure is explained in the previous verse. It's talking about the light inside of us. So that, that verse, that whole chapter, Judges chapter 7, that's almost like giving us some insight onto a New Testament verse. The fact that that light inside of us sometimes is best service, best used, best more visible when that vessel itself is broken. It's a great spiritual picture. Sometimes that's what God requires of us. God uses broken things. I mean, let's face it, you all know about the story about uh, Christ feeding the 5,000. He started with uh, five loaves and two small fish. And of course he broke that bread and, and blessed it before he fed it. It demonstrated God's awesome power, but also gave us the principle that God's grace is available to all of mankind. It's not just for believers. It's for every human being, every soul. 
The Bible says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. You know, uh, I mentioned this also. I think uh, we talked about it the other, uh, maybe last night, talking about this woman named Mary, Mary of Bethany, who anointed the head and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, and anointed him with oil. And uh, it says she got this oil out of an alabaster box. And it's very precious ointment. If you read, uh, that account is mentioned in all four Gospels. But only in the account given by Mark does the Bible inform us that that woman, Mary, in order to get that ointment out of that alabaster box, Mark said that she break the box. God uses broken things. And as I mentioned the other night, uh, the real deep teaching uh, for that particular historical event is what's recorded in Luke, where the Lord tells Martha, who is cumbered about much serving, that Mary hath chosen that one needful thing, the one thing most needful, and that's our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we get a lot of stuff out of these pictures, the, these historical events. Think about Paul's shipwreck. This Acts 27, and he's on this voyage, and uh, it encounters this great storm. And in Acts 27, I think just in the last 10 verses of that chapter, the word broken is used three times. Once after Paul is visited by this uh, spirit, and that spirit tells him, look, you're going you're gonna to make it to Rome to be tried before Caesar, and all that stay on this ship with you will make it as well. And so uh, he tells these men who have been battling the storm for a couple weeks now, they haven't eaten anything. In fact, they've been using all their energy to toss over the cargo and some of the equipment for handling the ship and so forth. And Paul says, you need to eat. So he gets some bread, he blesses it, and then breaks it as he passes it out. The second usage of the word broken is when that ship starts to encounter some more shallow water. I think it says the forefront was uh, stuck and the hinder part was broken from the crashing of the waves, something like that. And then the last usage of the word broken where it said that some of those sailors floated to shore on broken pieces of the ship. I like that one because it's italicized. And we talked about that the other night. Those italicized words, I believe they're every bit as inspired as the words that aren't italicized. And that's, made, that's a personal thing, maybe. And I, you know, if you buy into that, fine. If you don't, that's, that's OK with me. I just think that highly of that book. Uh, God uses broken things. Um, matter of fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, He hath sent me, talking about God the Father, He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. King David, when he wrote Psalm 51, said, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Well, I want to get a little more practical. Something really practical. I want you to go back to uh, Proverbs chapter 6. I want to be, you to be thinking about some of the things that maybe you need to let go of. And in order to do that, I'm going to do a little teaching here. And uh, I, I guess I'll incorporate a little bit of my personal testimony in this. You know, one of the reasons um, I think I indicated the other night when I went to Bible school and I had to get up and preach in front of people, and I wasn't too comfortable with that idea of doing that. I had grown up in all my life. I had this uh, certain disability that I was labeled with. Maybe a disability you've labeled yourself with or your children. And that was that word, shy. Now, I want to tell you something about that word. That's just a sweet little three-letter word ending in Y. But it's not all that sweet and innocent. And this is not a theory of mine. It's really part of my personal testimony. Um, because, and again, I'm just going to compare it to another three-letter word ending in Y that sounds sweet and innocent, but isn't. And that's the word gay. 
Now, I'm not comparing these two things. They've got nothing to do with each other. They're just words that have a certain connotation to them that's pleasant. But neither one of them is that pleasant. I mean, why don't people use the Bible word for gay? I'll tell you why they don't use it. Most people don't know what that word means. When I was uh, a teenager and we were talking about someone that today they call gay, the word that was very common then was homosexual. All right? And uh, even that word did not sit well with these people. And that's why there's a great book called The Marketing of Evil. And it talks about how back in the, I think it was the early 60s, like-minded men got together in a hotel room in Chicago and sat around with the sole purpose of coming up with a term, a word, to replace the word homosexual. And this is what they came up with. Hence the title of the book, The Marketing of Evil. That's no accident. So, I'm not saying, I haven't said anything positive or negative about that. You know what the Bible says about it. I don't have to say anything. But I want to tell you, this is not a sweet little innocent word that you think it is. Because really what that means at its core, it's someone that is self-willed. And you and I should be very wary, very concerned about the danger of applying to ourselves in any positive way anything with the word self in front of it. My Bible, the Bible I, you profess to use and believe in, the Bible says, deny thyself. So, to be self-willed is not a good thing. Uh, you say, well, that's just another word for saying you're self-conscious. Yeah, it is. You know what we're supposed to be? God-conscious. I'll tell you what it really means at its core. It means to be self-centered. That's not what God wants. When you're working on the potter's wheel, the hardest thing the potter does is center the clay on the wheel as it's spinning. And he can't proceed unless he gets that clay centered. Then he can begin the next step, which is dropping the hole, opening the floor, and so forth. You're going to do something that matters for the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to get yourself centered on his will and get that will off of yourself. I'll, t I'll be honest with you. When I was in the eighth grade, I was given, uh, I, you know, back then, I don't really know how you got your classes. They just showed up. They gave them to you. I was in a speech class. Well, the speech class is the farthest thing from my mind that I would ever do. Now, the classes are like nine months long. You know, eighth grade, we started in the fall, and we wrote some poems. And then toward the middle of the year, we started writing some speeches. And I think the last three, four weeks of the year, we were asked to come up and recite or read or present whatever, a poem or speech. All I know is I never, ever did that. I don't recall the excuses I made, but probably four or five times during that four-week period, I was called upon to come up and do my thing. And like I say, I don't recall what I said, but I do recall the last time I was asked. And I saw that when I said no or whatever I said, the teacher, I just saw his, the blood begin to boil. And he turned red. And the veins in his neck started to stand out. And then he pointed his finger at me and said, your brain must be as smooth as a rubber ball. <laughs> and I'm terrified, but I have no idea what he's talking about. What does that mean? I come to find out your brain, when you're born, is very smooth. But every time you have a thought, it creates a wrinkle in your brain. You talk about scar scarred for life. It's too bad it went right over my head. Maybe that's because I had a bowling ball brain or whatever. I don't know. I want to tell you, this is not a good thing. Don't allow your children to cop out. I appreciate these young ladies that came up here and sang. That's probably uncomfortable for them. I, I don't know. You know, I've gotten to the actual point, you know, I've been doing this 15 years now. And about three or four years ago, it stopped being uncomfortable. But I mean, I was a basket case. I just came from Sam Witter's church up there. He was in my class. He made a big thing about it before I got up the first night at his church and talked about it. This Angusath guy, man, if you would have seen him in school. <laughs> just like, he thought I was just like this. <laughs> and I probably was, you know, but God's using me, whatever. But man, he's like in shock that I'm in ministry. 
and I can put two words together without, you know, having a heart. When I was in school, up there, you could see this going, like that. You know, my heart was like, I was ready for the emergency room or something. This is a cop-out. Now, I want to do a little teaching here. Proverbs chapter 6. We read verse 15, so let's look in verse 16. I want to teach you something about pride, because that is what this stems from. When you are self-willed, self-conscious, self-centered, your focus is on you, and that's pride. I want to tell you, I'm going to show you what the Bible says about it. In essence, God hates pride. So verse 16, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. First on the list, a proud look. We're going to stay in the book of Proverbs. We're going to look at a half a dozen verses here. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. 8.13. The Bible says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Colon. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. Pretty clear. Go to Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Okay. We're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ in depth tomorrow. And one of the things I'm going to try to get across to you right here and now and then is that when you think of the word shame, when you read the word shame, you say the word shame or hear it or whatever, I want you to think about the judgment seat of Christ. Because we're going to come to find out that one of the potential downsides of that, it's going to be great, you're going to be up there, you may be getting all these kinds of rewards and earned inheritance and all this wonderful stuff, but there's also the downside of being feeling naked and ashamed. And that should motivate you to not want to have that experience of the judgment seat of Christ, because God doesn't want you to have that experience. And I know in your heart of hearts you don't want it either. Only when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowliness is wisdom. Turn to uh, Proverbs 13. If this one wasn't in the Bible, I don't know that I'd believe it, but it is in the Bible, so I do believe it. Proverbs 13.10, only by pride cometh contention. You have any contention in your life? I mean, if you really think about it, maybe every day there's a little contention. I mean, I can go into Walmart and I'm searching around, and I don't like to go into Walmart because I'm old, and I don't like to go in there and look for my one thing that I want. It's not like I go in there and shop for the week. I go in there, I'm looking for one thing, I can't find it, I can't find anybody to help me. And then finally, I'm back in some corner somewhere, and I might find the thing or not, but it's time to get out of there, and now I'm trying to, how do I get out of this place? You know? The stuff's piled like 12 feet high, and you're like in a maze. Anyway, then you get up to the front there, and you're trying to choose the shortest line, and that never works. You're starting to fume and boil. It's all about pride. Like, who, are, who am I that I should just be, you know, shuffle this guy up to the front of the line? You know, only by pride come with contention. Contention can be very subtle, and uh, if you're honest with you, it stems from pride. Go to 29, Proverbs 29. Seems like we're skipping over something here. Go to Proverbs, uh, let's go there, yeah. Go to Proverbs... Uh, uh, 16. Proverbs 16. Pride goeth before destruction. Verse 18, excuse me. 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Oh. I think if we skipped over one, sounds right. 13, 10. Go to 14, 3. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. Pride goeth before destruction, a high spirit before fall. There's all kinds of proverbs, and pride is mentioned all throughout our Bible. You know, uh, there's a really pretty good king called King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was very mighty and very powerful. And what happened to him, unfortunately, he had this huge fortress around his kingdom. And then he had these cunning men that invented things. They were called engines. And what they were were war machines, like machines to shoot all kinds of arrows at great distance with some accuracy, and to catapult heavy boulders uh, for the purposes of killing people with some accuracy. The Bible says this about King Uzziah. When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. 
is talking about pride. Because what happened with King Uzziah, he was so physically strong that he started to get proud about that to the point where he thought, I'm going to take some incense and go into the Holy of Holies and offer this incense up to the Lord. And even though he was the king, he was not allowed to do that. That was a special thing that was only allowed by the high priest, I think, once a year. So King Isaiah, could, before he could actually perform what he was about to do, the Lord stuck him, struck him with leprosy, a type of sin. And he had that until the day he died. That's too bad, all because of pride. When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Obadiah 3, I think, says, The, the pride of thy heart hath deceived thee. You know, we've got to be wary of pride. We've got to realize we have a, an enemy who is very subtle. And in fact, I think it's Job 41. That chapter concludes with talking about Leviathan, which is another word for Satan or Lucifer, the <clears throat> devil. And it says that he is the king of the children of pride. So what the Bible is telling us, the principle is this. When we allowed pride to enter into our hearts, even for a short period of time, during that period of time, we are serving the king of the children of pride. The devil. That's the truth. That's the principle. You want to stay away from that. Turn to uh, Psalm 31. I I'm having you look at this one psalm because as far as I know, this is the only possible verse that you could misinterpret about pride unless you already knew the principle. So the last verse of Psalm 31, it's verse 23, says this, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. So, you know, if you didn't know better, you'd say, well, okay, there's an exception to the rule. No. What's, what's trouble, what tricks us up there is when we see that word reward, we always think that reward is a good thing. That's not the way God uses the word reward. You want to do a fruitful study? Study the word reward in your King James Bible. I'd say about 50% of the time, it's someone getting something negative because that's what they deserve. So what this verse is doing, it's like a lot of the parables where it is learning by contrast. And this verse is contrasting something good, the faithful, with something bad the proud doer. Let me give you a couple of examples. In 2 Samuel 3, the Bible says, the Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Pretty clear. Uh, when Paul was praying at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4, talking about Alexander the coppersmith, he said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. I pray therefore that the Lord reward him according to to his works. That's Paul praying for something bad to happen to Alexander the coppersmith. Listen, God hates pride. you got to know that. And, and, and that will help you maybe appreciate this little teaching I'm about to turn you on to here. And this is my suggestion for the body of Christ. Knowing what God thinks about pride knowing how subtle our enemy is, that he would nothing, prefer nothing greater than to get you sidetracked by getting you proud, I suggest you find a way to avoid using this phrase. The phrase, I am proud. And uh, I'll be honest with you, you know, when I was brought up, my parents said, you should be proud of the work you do, your schoolwork. You should take pride in that. You should take pride in the way you dress. You should take pride in the work you do around the house. You know, stuff like that. If we were to be church goers, they probably said, you should be proud of the church you go to. You should be proud of your pastor. You know, you might say, well, I'm proud of my garden. I put all this work into it and look how beautiful it is, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to give you an idea here, and I want you to just consider it. You know, I was in Nashville, um, like in April, uh, on our, that was the beginning of our journey out west here. 
And the Lord worked it out. It was just wonderful. Where we got, we don't see, get to see our grandchildren very often. But we are in Nashville about 10 days. And during that 10 days, we got to see our, our, our two grandsons that are there uh, play in their last two games of their baseball season. And they, they actually played in the last game of the season, won it. And so they got to play the next day in the little championship game. And we got to see them play in that one and win it as well. And it's just a blessing. You know, and I could have said, "Oh, I'm so proud of you guys," but I don't. I don't use that phrase because I found other ways to express the same idea. I like this better. I like to say, "I am grateful." You say, "What's the big deal?" Well, I don't care what it is that you fill in this blank with. If you go out here, hopefully, what you're saying is you're grateful to God. And no matter what this is, if you're proud of your grandchildren, if you're proud of your parents, if you're proud of your schoolwork or the, 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 your report card or whatever it may be, no matter what it is, the emphasis comes back here and it's pointed right at you. I am proud. God hates that. Get away from that. Instead, whether you say it or not, you could say, I am grateful. It puts the emphasis where it belongs, on God. The Bible says, what does a man have that he hasn't received? It also says, every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights. Listen, whether you say God or not, that's a better way to say it. It keeps you from being proud. You could use other words. How about, I am thankful, or I am blessed, or I am happy. You know? I mean, I am grateful to be wherever I am today. Where am I? Billings, Montana. I'm grateful to be here. I have to think about that. Hectic life. Uh, I'm thankful that all of you showed up tonight. I'm blessed to have my wife with me on this particular trip that we're taking. And she can't come into all the meetings, but she makes 99.9% .9 of them. And I'm just happy to be in ministry. I'm happy to have the potential for God to use me. And sometimes I fall flat on my face and I don't allow him to use me to my fullest potential. But I have that opportunity he gives me on a regular basis. So get away from this and start using this. And it will maybe help you to avoid that pitfall of allowing pride to enter your life. You know, I think it's a great thing if your pastor preaches a, a good sermon and you come up to tell him something uh, without puffing him up. Something like, I appreciate you. I'm grateful for the message. I needed that. But you don't just come up and say, oh, brother, that's the greatest thing I ever heard. You are the absolute best preacher I ever heard. <laughs> you know, because the danger in that, the danger of anyone in ministry, the danger of anyone allowing God to use them for his purposes is for us to think like, wow, I'm something special now, because we're not. What we've done is we succeeded in just yielding our will to his and allowing him to do something through us, and it's all him. What does a man have that he hasn't received? Zero. Everything, every good gift, every good perfect gift is from above. Listen, try not to use it. Words are so important. That word shy, that's important. That word proud, that's important. My son, who graduated PBI four years before me, he worked for Dr. Kent Hovind while he was down there. He's like the first, he's like the foremost authority does a great job on debating people that believe in evolution. And he likes to tell them how creation is a more sure thing than evolution. So he will debate them. And my son, since he worked for him for several years, uh, well, not several years, he worked for him for a full year, I believe, uh, and he did some meetings with Dr. Hoven. And be, by the time that uh, relationship had finished, my son, till to this day, will no longer use the word evolve. Because things literally do not evolve. Now, you can talk about evolution as a theory, but they teach evolution or the idea of things evolving as a fact in the schools. And I, I, every time I, I, played golf with a, I played golf with a couple teachers the last few weeks, one right here in... Um, in Dillon, in, in, uh, in Billings, last week we were in wherever, up in, uh, uh, up there, Polson, yeah, 
up there I played golf with another teacher. And I mean, I ask these guys, uh, now do you teach evolution as a fact or is it theory? Oh, it's a fact. It's not like they didn't even tell me they teach it as a fact. Oh, it is a fact. And that's how they're taught. I mean, what are you going to yeah, talk about brainwash? So my son won't use that word. As a matter of fact, at graduation from PBI, we had the first year class over at our house. And uh, we had a house in Pensacola, and I had the, the opportunity. Uh, we owned our own home there, and I had this opportunity to build this deck out in the backyard. And it really took me almost three years to build it. I started, it had like a concrete slab out there, like a 8 by 12. And so I added a little deck, like uh, two steps up, and it might have been an 8 by 10. And then a couple months later, I added another part over here, you know, whatever, 12 by 16, whatever. Anyway, by the time it was all done, right before graduation, my deck ended up being about 1,400 square feet. Nice. It had seven levels. It had steps, a ramp. Part of it surrounded a 150-year-old oak tree. I had my pottery kiln and a little studio out there at a ping pong. It was, it was awesome. I had this brother and my, and my son sitting on this bench there. This guy's looking around and said, Brother Angus, how, how did you ever, ever design this thing? It's incredible. I said, I didn't design it. It just evolved. <laughs> my son looks at me, Dad. It's still a deck. <laughs> yeah, it didn't evolve, it just developed. So what these evolutionists will teach you, or try to convince you of, and what they believe is that given enough time, a banana will evolve into a timber wolf. I mean, now how much faith does that take? More, more than it takes to believe in a creator. You know, this is not true just in case you have any doubts. <laughs> Think about that word pride, by the way. The center letter is the word I. Same letter that's in the center of the word Lucifer and sin and Laodicean and a 13 letter word, with the center letter I called unforgiveness. We need to beware of pride in our life. It's, that's all about us. That's not good. Turn to Matthew. Matthew 21. We're talking about you and I allowing God to break us so that we can let God have his will and his way in our lives. Here near the end of Matthew 21, let's pick it up in verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Those are two very uncomfortable situations to imagine yourself in. But if I had to choose one over the other, I would choose the first one, being broken, versus being ground to powder. Because really, it sounds to me like if you're going to be ground to powder, it'd be broken as well as ground to powder. My point is this. I think what the scriptures are trying to tell us, if we, don't, if we need breaking, and the God, our, our loving Heavenly Father, will break us, as gently and mercifully as he can if we allow him to. Otherwise, he's going to prolong and intensify the process. And we're the ones prolonging it. And again, I, if I haven't mentioned it succinctly, I'll try to. In the year 2003, when I went from just leading a nominal Christian life to deciding to surrender fully to the Lord, it was because he put me under a severe affliction, and he combined that affliction 
with just a childlike knowledge of the judgment seat of Christ. Those two things combined to get a hold of my heart. I look back after that, and I thought, boy, you know what? I can see where he tried to kind of break me, like maybe 10, 12 years before that. And then even before that, there might be another six, eight years before that, he tried to even more gently. Well, what am I getting at? If I'd have been more sensitive to what he was trying to do to me so that he could do something through me, I might have prolonged, uh, not, you know, I wouldn't have been in such agony all those years later, let me put it that way. I could have not wasted 30 years of my Christian life. I might have only wasted, wasted, uh, or wasted 8 or 10 or maybe 20, depending on which time I would have given in. I want to tell you this. In 2003, when I tell you he put me under a serious affliction, I pretty much thought it was it. I thought it was over. I'm going to die. It's all over. You know, and that's when I surrendered to the Lord. Let me read you something from this book. A very sold-out brother, his name's uh, Richard Yerby, he's a missionary to Japan. He wrote this book, Creature versus Creator. He's talking about the struggle of us, the creature, versus our creator, God. And he talks about the wars of all time. Wars have been going on since before the Garden of Eden, actually, uh, since Satan uh, first rebelled up in the air somewhere. He said, the greatest war, the greatest significance is the war between the creature and the creator. Every human creature on the face of this earth is fighting to some extent in this battle. This war of all wars is also a paradox of all paradoxes. It is impossible for the creature, that's us, to gain any victory by fighting in this war. In fact, he is guaranteed defeat simply by engaging in battle. And the more fiercely he fights, the more loss he suffers. Are you getting this? I mean, we're at war when we're not in lined up with God's purposes for our life. We're at battle with him. And he's a whole lot stronger than we are. Are we insane to battle that? We should just let go and let God have his way. Uh, the more fiercely he fights, the more loss he suffers. suffers. This war is a paradox of all paradoxes because the creator by his nature, is no enemy to the creature. He wants only the best for his beloved creature. Therefore, the most profitable thing that the creature can do is to surrender to the creator and completely cease to war against the creator in all areas of conflict. Another great paradox of this war is that the human creature who comes the closest to total surrender, he's not slain, he's not destroyed, he's not... Uh, treated as a lackey or a slave or a prisoner. Rather, the Creator will crown him, and for all eternity, he or she will be highly honored. Kind of a reference to the judgment seat of Christ there, where God wants to pass out crowns and earned inheritance to those that allow themselves to be used by him for his purposes. So he goes concluded by saying this, how about doing the wisest thing that you can do and cease to battle against your creator. Wave the white flag of your heart to the fullest and tell your creator, I surrender all. Good advice. We should heed that advice. So. I want you to think about the Lord Jesus Christ And that how he himself was broken for us on that cross at Calvary. As a matter of fact, you could say that he took upon himself the proud, unbroken ego of fallen mankind. And he was broken in our place. If you think about his life, the last days, the last hours of his life. He's in that upper room. And he's in that upper room. He entertaining the disciples for that last supper. He takes out that bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Christ said that word. He didn't say that according to Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. That's a quote taken from the Apostle Paul. 
Did I tell you something about the Apostle Paul? Because he wasn't in that room. He obviously spent some time alone with the resurrected Jesus Christ. Christ leaves that upper room, finds himself shortly after that in that garden of Gethsemane. And he's in that garden in Gethsemane, he's praying to God the Father. He says something to the effect of, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So at that moment in time, Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, our creator, our savior, had a broken will. He leaves that garden, and shortly after that, he finds himself on a cross at Calvary. He's on that cross, and some of the last words out of his mouth there, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So not only a broken body in the upper room, a broken will in the Garden of Gethsemane, but on that cross at Calvary in that last moment of time, he had broken fellowship with God the Father. Christ did all that for you and for me. Why would we be afraid of letting go and allowing him to break us of something that we might need for our benefit and his? So I guess my question as we close this is getting you to try to think of something maybe that you're hanging on to that you should let go of. It might be something physical like a television set or a computer screen or a cell phone. It might be that new car or that bigger house or that second house. It could be some sport, uh, some recreational activity that you're engaged in. You know, any of these things I may list are not necessarily wrong, but they might be wrong for you to the extent that they're occupying your time. I hope uh, you might not have to let go of uh, your education or your bank account or your children or your parents or a close friend. It could be something you're putting in your mouth like alcohol or drugs or tobacco. It could be prescription medicine. Am I saying that the prescription medicine is wrong? No. But sometimes people get dependent on it when it even ceases to help them anymore. I don't know. And then they just add that to another prescription, to another prescription. Real slippery slope. Hey, I'm, I'm just trying to get you to think of some things in your life. And maybe if I didn't say anything, you'd have no problem just thinking of those things yourself. I don't know. It could be fashion. It could be, if you think about your senses, it could be the things we look at the things we put in our mouth, the things we touch with our hands, the things we allow to enter our ears and our eyes. Could be any of those things. Could be kind of internal things like pride or bitterness or rebellion or unforgiveness. Could be fear of man. Could be all kinds of things. I just want you to think about what it is. Is there a thing or two that maybe... God would have you to let go of? Let me phrase it another way. Maybe you'd like to let God make your everyday decisions. If that's the case, maybe you need to let go of your independence and your self-reliance. Maybe you want to let God use you to minister to a, a lost soul or a troubled brother or sister in Christ. Well, then you might need to let go of your comfort zone or your self-centeredness. Maybe God wants to, or you'd like God to heal a difficult relationship. There's probably in this room with this many people, there's probably several of you in here that maybe are having some kind of trouble with one of your relationships, with a family, friend, a co-worker, whatever. Um, God will do his part, but you have to do your part, and your part might be letting go of something in order for him to feel that, heal that difficult relationship. Maybe he's going to need you to let go of that unforgiveness or bitterness or self-esteem or self-love or self-pity, any of those self things. Rebellion could be anything.
Maybe you just want God to shape you into a vessel unto honor. Then why don't you let go of your inflexibility and your self-control and just put your trust and faith in God. Empty and broken, I came back to him. A vessel unworthy, so marred with sin. But he did not despair. He started over again. And I bless the day he didn't throw the clay away. Over and over he molds me and makes me into his likeness. He fashions the clay. If I am a vessel of honor one day, then it's all because Jesus didn't throw the clay away. He is the potter and I am the clay molded in his image. He wants me to stay. But when I stumble and I fall and my vessel breaks, he just picks up the pieces. He doesn't throw the clay away. Over and over, he molds me and makes me into his likeness. He fashions the clay. If I am a vessel of honor one day, then it's all because Jesus didn't throw this clay away. Christian, what do you need to let go of so that you can let God rule and reign in your life? Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've given us tonight. Thank you for your precious word of God. And thank you for the truths that you show us through those words. Lord, help us to have the courage by your grace to examine our hearts. Uh, we might recognize maybe a thing or two in our lives that we'd be better off letting go of so that we can give you the th complete authority and complete ability to accomplish your purposes through our lives for your pleasure and for your glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Uh, and we didn't do anything on Wednesday night after the service. We just sung a song and were dismissed. Last night, uh, we just sang two verses of a song and were dismissed. But let's let the piano play for a couple minutes. And remember that the Lord speaks in a still, small voice. If the Lord spoke to you about something here, it's not that... The Lord's not going to say, uh, give up your family and jump off a bridge. and <laughs> That's not the Lord speaking. The Lord speaks in a still, small voice. And if he's speaking to you, this is a good time. We'll have some just real quiet piano playing. Take maybe two or three minutes. Don't get in a hurry to get out of here. There's nothing else going on tonight. It's more important than you hearing from God and listening to what he's speaking. We'll sing a song here in just a minute.
continue in prayer. Just sit there and talk to the Lord if you'd like to sing. 394. 394. We don't usually sit and sing, but let's try that tonight. If you want to keep praying, you don't have to sing. 394 is I Surrender All. Let's sing a couple verses of this before we're dismissed. All to Jesus I surrender song leader, so I don't have to sing when I'm under conviction, too. I got hit. <laughs> it's, good. it's good to get preached at every once in a while. Let's try the third verse. Sing the, sing the third verse there. fourth verse be dismissed on the fourth all to Jesus I surrender Lord I give myself to thee fill me with thy love and power let thy blessings fall on me I surrender afternoon I looked up pottery in the Bible. I looked up pot and everything that ends with the, or that starts with P-O-T in the Bible. And I just skimmed through there. I was looking for maybe just a different thought, something to prepare for tonight. And I decided not to say anything. But I, what I noticed was uh, there's a lot of stuff gets broken in there. He's breaking those pots over and over and over. I'm going to break you into shivers. I'm going to break you, and you're not going to be used again. I'm going to break you, and I will use you again. And there won't be anything left but the smallest shard that you can't even use to... I thought, I just had a bad feeling about that blue one that he broke. I had a bad feeling about that. Something was going to happen to it. I'm glad it wasn't me that broke it. I just... (laughs) It just looked kind of puffy, kind of, kind of too pretty for its own good or something. I don't know. But, you know, I think he told me the other day he could still take that and grind it back up and add some water and still use it and turn it into a vessel again. And if the Lord's breaking you, just let him, just let him. He'll use you. All right, I better stop talking. Okay. Uh, Brother Mark, would you close us out in a word of prayer, please? Father, we're so thankful for your word. Thank you, Father. You are the Father, Lord, and you are the Christ. Father, may we be yielded to your will for our lives, Lord, that we live a life that pleases to be. We thank you for our good brother, Lord, showing us, Lord, how we, Father, just need to get some of these things out of our lives, these impurities, Lord, that hold us back. So, Father, uh, continue to God and bless. We pray your blessing be upon the search tomorrow. We pray to God that 
as your word is brought forth. Lord, and we will look at our own lives, Lord, and Father, that we will desire to serve you. Dismiss us with your blessings, Lord, bring us back here safely tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, have a good evening. See you in the morning.